I'm Christopher Kassan, and this is Ireland's Edge. On today's episode, how do we make sense of geopolitical upheaval? The ongoing Russian invasion of Ukraine has highlighted radical changes in international affairs, but the nature of a new global political order is far from clear, with complex crises of energy and food security bubbling underneath shifts in strategic power alliances. John Kampfner has covered international politics for more than 35 years. He reported on the fall of the Berlin Wall and the dissolution of the Soviet Union for the Daily Telegraph, before working as chief political correspondent for the Financial Times. At the BBC, he covered politics for the Today programme at Newsnight, and later edited the New Statesman. His books on Russia, Germany, capitalism and democracy have become bestsellers, and he currently serves as executive director of the UK and the World Project at Chatham House, Britain's leading foreign policy think tank. In front of a live audience at Ireland's Edge and Dingle, John joined Maureen Kelleher to discuss A World in Flux. I'm joined here by John Kampfner, who is very welcome to Dingle. John and I spoke before at an Ireland's Edge, but it wasn't an Ireland's Edge in this room. It was one along the banks of the Spree in Berlin in 2019. Um, John, I'm just going to let you introduce yourself. Um, the city of Berlin, where we spoke to you, uh, a pretty auspicious city in your life. Maybe will you take us from the events of how you found yourself to be there in 1991 and a little snapshot of the ground you've covered since? Well, first of all, I must say, uh, you've, you've um, blocked out this, this view because I'm not surprised. It is the most amazing view. This is the most amazing place. And thank you so much for, for having me here. And I've always wanted to... Um, when we first spoke in 2019, I said, oh, have me back, have me here, it'd be amazing. And, and, it, sh and it surely is, so um, hi there, everybody. So yeah, Berlin is sort of my second home. Um, I was there as a young cub reporter for the Daily Telegraph, um, sent there in 1988. <clears throat> I was that newspaper's first and last um, accredited correspondent to the German Democratic Republic. Uh, I was based in East Berlin at the time, but <clears throat> could go across between the two, something I didn't advertise to my East German friends, and I was just extremely fortunate to be able to witness um, the most amazing year and a half of, uh, of my life professionally, I think, the fall of the Berlin Wall German unification, which for all the complaints people can legitimately have about it, I defy anybody to come up with any other country that could have achieved unification, the bringing together of, of peoples um, from two different political systems, uh, increasingly two different political um, cultures and social cultures, and bring them together with so little acrimony and with so little difficulty. And um, that is why, um, so I was there and then I went on to, to Moscow. Uh, where I saw the Soviet system collapse as well, and it was also an incredibly optimistic time um, for Russia. And uh, if we talk about Ukraine as well, um, it's with an incredibly heavy heart because everything that has happened to Russia, not just since February 24th, but for the last 10 or 15 years, has been just a terrible one-way spiral to dictatorship, to aggression, and to a really miserable failed state and failing state and, and it's and I say that with incredible sadness. Anyway, so then that other great achievement of modern times, Brexit, um, happens and I just think, right, I've had it. I've really, really had it. Um, the Germans call it, by the way, and I know this is an island, but they call they call Britain now the Insel, the island. Um, and when Boris Johnson was in charge they called it the Party Insel as well, um, just the idea that the only thing that ever took place in Britain was just people breaking rules and having parties and things. And um, I thought, right, I need to go to a grown-up country. So I went back and sort of rediscovered Germany, rediscovered Berlin um, from the end of 2018. So uh, when we met then, that was still fairly early in my cycle. Uh, notwithstanding lockdowns and COVID, I, I probably spent just under a half of my time since then, I wrote a book um, which uh, I certainly enjoyed writing called Why the Germans Do It Better, Notes from a Grown-Up Country, um, which um, had some great reviews, but my favourite one was uh, in my old paper, The Daily Telegraph, 
when Simon Heffer called it uh, Brexit revenge porn, um, <laughs> which I thought was quite good. Um, and uh, I'm now finishing off um, an 800-year history of Berlin, which I have to hand in by the middle of February for publication so maybe in October. So before we come to that 800-year history then, maybe coming into the moment, and you know, you've characterised it here as a moment of disjuncture. It hasn't <coughs> landed, as you say, just this year. There are events proceeding up to it, but nonetheless, maybe in even our popular imagination or our construction of the world we live in, there's certain truths which we have been forced to confront this year um, that are no longer relevant or no longer an organising framework. How do you characterise the moment that we're in now? It depends which way you look. I mean, looking at it from Britain, Britain now has the second worst performing economy in the OECD, better only than Russia's. Um, it has a health service on its knees. Um, it feels, um, Britain feels an incredibly unhappy country that has made a decision that only now I think a tiny proportion of its original advocates yeah. would be prepared to defend. And it is interesting that increasingly the discussion is beginning to be had, you know, it should have been had and it was had in 2016, um, that uh, the economic damage, not to mention the political, diplomatic, and cultural and, and psychological damage that Brexit has done is something that is now beginning to be discussed. Now, maybe that's just an inevitable part of a cycle that things don't happen immediately and the advocates want, will things to be, to be true. COVID elongated that moment of reckoning by a year and a half or so because it was impossible in that period to be able to make a definitive uh, link between the two because all the economic numbers were obviously um, plunging as they were everywhere and people were saying well that's because of the pandemic and the lockdown um, and so in a way Brexit got a free pass for a year and a half but but the reckoning is happening now that is Britain all I mean a, a lot of the economic indicators are shared everywhere uh, rampant inflation rampant energy prices potential energy shortages um, uh, huge amounts of, of in, uh, increasing poverty and increasing inequality. So there are m many of the economic and socio-cultural problems facing uh, the Western world, Europe, um, are generic, but I would argue that they are particularly acute now in the UK. And if you move into then kind of a world of geopolitics between living now in a multipolar world, mm -hmm. We ha it's populated by lead actors, let's say, across the US, China, and an increasing set of middle countries. What, what do you make of that setup, and in terms of how it changes our political calculations, trade calculations, corporate calculations? I mean, there's, there's two, probably there's two questions uh, there. Are, are, are the question of middle countries and pivot countries I'll come to because I'm increasingly fascinated by this phenomenon. On the question of America and China, um, and if you go back to 2016 and was, was that peak populism or whatever, um, I fluctuate wildly between feeling deeply, deeply gloomy about the, the future of democracy and actually feeling a little bit optimistic now. Um, one by one, tiny little markers are being laid by um, political leaders, political parties that have not fallen into the populist um, vortex. Um, the, the midterms in America were not great, but they were one hell of a lot better than everybody was predicting. Yeah. For the Democrats, is Trump a busted flush? Well, time will tell, but he's certainly... His, his, his march back to the White House, which would, were it to happen, I think potentially spend, spell the end of American democracy, because I think he would trash the Constitution. He would, um, he's got enough secretaries of state in the different 
um, American uh, states now that would deny any future election result were he still to be in the, in the White House. And um, something terrible would happen far, far worse than we saw in that January um, at Congress were he to be allowed back in. Is that scaring enough Republicans not to endorse him for the candidacy? Um, I mean, Ron DeSantis and the others are, are no angels, but I have the slight, and, and they're very, very right wing, but have the impression that at least they um, have a, a sense of the importance of the constitutional settlement. So you see that, you see Bolsonaro just by a whisker losing in Brazil, and just you see the odd sign here and there <coughs> that maybe, maybe people are rediscovering democracy, which is where Ukraine comes in and the and John maybe on that I suppose maybe one of the um, one of the dimensions that some alignment has emerged between both parties in the US is on an increased um, over the last number of years uh, articulation of the US rivalry with China and a very clear sense of we have potential areas of cooperation on stuff like climate and but we are now very clearly that we have areas of rivalry in terms of foundational technologies in terms of trade we are now asking we, we are demanding behaviors of corporates that we did not ask for before um, what is your and obviously we see you know we have seen an increasingly authoritarian China um, we see, uh, I suppose, the, the years of the COVID years now um, and the, the policy decisions that China took in relation to COVID, finding um, their faces on the streets in this moment. So when you stand back and you look at China's role in this world in relation to the US, but it's broader Belt and Road and it's middle country relationships. I mean, I'm, I'm no China expert, but, but seen through my naked eye, there was a sense three or four years ago um, that whatever you thought of Xi Jinping, that he had tailwind, that this Chinese model, there was never a, there was never a Russian model. There's never been a Putin model, unless kleptocracy is your, is, is your thing. But there is a Chinese alternative model to the, the Western uh, American led one, and that was increasingly popular in the Global South, in the Middle East, in the Gulf, uh, and elsewhere. And actually, I call it the Singapore model writ large, in which people willingly give up their, what I call their public freedoms, uh, freedom of, of political expression, freedom to uh, start political movements and parties and that sort of thing, in return for security and prosperity but they maintain certain levels of private freedoms, uh, freedom to travel, freedom to educate your kids, freedom to wear what you like and, and, and do what you like in your, in, your, in your own life. Now, that is an attractive model. When it works, what's happened in China and what has happened with the, um, the zero COVID policy is that any pretense at private freedoms have gone out the window with this massive surveillance state. Yeah. And so the attractiveness, plus a lot of these Belt and Road contracts have, have not worked and there's a lot of um, resentment among recipient countries that have found themselves indebted or that the, the infrastructure wasn't working the way it was supposed to. So a lot of gloss has gone, gone off this, yeah. this, this rival Chinese model. Now, you, the American model um, was uh, corroding a long time before Trump came along. I've always argued that Trump, Brexit, and all these other phenomena were never the cause of anything. They were symptoms of, of, of longer-term malaise. Um, and America has had so many uh, fundamental schisms and problems in its society for a long time. That notwithstanding, the sense of the inevitable global progress of China is not looking anything like as assured as it used to. And you said that the case of the middle countries is particularly interesting to you. If you look back at the, um, I think it was the 2nd of March at the UN, the um, General Assembly vote condemning uh, Russia's invasion of, of Ukraine, I think it was 141 countries backed the motion. Five countries, North Korea, Syria, Russia, Belarus, and I think Eritrea, 
um, voted against. That, that, you know, that's uh, not of any particular interest. Uh, what was really, really interesting was 35 countries abstaining. And they included three Commonwealth countries uh, of enormous uh, importance and power, India, Pakistan, and South Africa. And if you throw in other countries as well, you have this increasingly important phenomenon, in my view, of these middle countries, these middle states, regional players um, all over the place. Um, and who are you referring to specifically? <coughs> well, those three countries, I think one really important country that has become absolutely pivotal in the Russia-Ukraine crisis, but um, beyond if you look at the issues now with Ethiopia, Eritrea and Tigray, uh, it's Turkey. And Erdogan is uh, nobody's idea of a paragon of democratic virtue. But what he has done in terms of manoeuvring Turkey into that pivotal position is really, really important. India, absolutely central. Um, as Western countries are, are looking, just as you were talking about, about distancing themselves and their supply chains from China, so they're looking to diversify. So the ASEAN countries, countries of Southeast Asia, Indonesia, um, Singapore, Malaysia and others uh, becoming incredibly important. So you can sort of trace a line, whether you're going east-west or, or west-east, from sort of Australia, Japan, South Korea, India, Turkey, um, all the way through. I think Poland is an absolutely crucial country and all of that. You go into, into Africa and Nigeria and South Africa, most of all. So the idea that there are just these two poles, America and China and, and the European Union sort of in the, in the middle and sort of Britain sort of floundering off in, 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 into the sea, um, I, I think is, is now, um, th you know, these two poles are still the most important, but there are a lot of players now who, um, and one of the lessons, and I've spoken to various diplomats about that vote at, at the General Assembly, was don't ever take these countries for granted. You don't tap them on the shoulder and say, you know, be a good chap. Are you on the are you on on the side of democracy or dictatorship? Are you a goodie or are you a baddie? Now go and vote in the right way. You're talking about really, really sustained political engagement with a whole host of many, many dozens of countries, the likes of which really hasn't happened before. And in that regard, John, even probably the the, the distance travelled between the UN vote and the G20 mm. communique is probably an interesting development in. Which is testament to um, some very good diplomacy all around. But who was chairing um, the G20? Very few people before it took place, certainly several weeks before it took place, gave the G20 any chance of coming up with any form of agreement or any form of communicate about anything. In fact, if people turned up, it was, it was regarded as a success. Now, Putin didn't, which was wise, but everybody else did. And they came out with a reasonable... Uh, communicate. Now, the Indonesians were, were, were chairing it and, by common consent, chaired it incredibly well. So, again, you have that sense now of everybody having to slightly realign in the way they, they actually practice diplomacy. And, John, maybe to move on to the country at which we originally started discussing, Germany, the German model um, has been... Some fundamental shocks have been thrown into that by... You're talking about football? <laughs> no, I actually am it. So, and, and I had to there, get that one in. If there is anything else, I will be unaware of what <laughs> may have happened within that sphere. No, um, I am talking about uh, how now Germany has had to reassess its stance on so many issues arising from the invasion. Absolutely. Um, and I'm a... As, as you know, and as anybody who's read my book knows, I'm, I'm an ardent Germanophile, and I've been so for um, many, many years. Um, I was, however, and, and I said so in the book, always concerned about its Russia policies. And uh, there are two celebrated occasions. As one, I was talking to um, the head of Bavarian TV in Munich, and he was former press spokesman to Merkel, and this was about four or five years ago. And I was going on about how on earth Gerhard Schroeder was able to get away with what he had done and, and all of that. You know, he should you know, probably be, you know, certainly you should investigate whether he'd done anything criminal and um, uh, the idea that you could be pretty much negotiating your 
contract onto a board of a Russian energy uh, company in your final days of being chancellor of uh, the most powerful Western European economy is, is just unconscionable. And, um, and yet there was very, very little um, complaint about it. And, and this guy said to me, and I was just getting more and more hot under the color in this conversation, he said, oh, stop getting so emotional. Uh, and I said, but, you know, this is potential criminality, or at least it's amorality. And it's, it's taken a long, long time. Um, and I try and scratch my head and, and think how much of this was venal, and I think there's certainly a certain amount of, of greed to it, how much was bad governance? And if you think of it crudely, the Germans subcontracted their defense to America, subcontracted a lot of their trade to China, and subcontracted their energy to Russia. You know, that's, that's not, uh, you know, not necessarily wise. A lot of it, I think, is, is um, emotional, and it's both an emotionally good reading and an emotionally faulty reading of German crimes in the Second World War. Um, I mean, anybody who um, studies um, Second World War history, uh, the, the crimes on the Eastern Front, um, you know, alongside the Holocaust, were you know, just e extraordinary. And Germany dealt with the Eastern Front in a very, and villages and occupied territories in a completely different way to the way it did with the Western Front. So there was an, you know, a massive amount of um, genetics-based, race-based uh, um, annihilation and, and um, uh, war crimes going on. And so for Germany and its, uh, to use the compound German word, Vergangenheitsbewältigung, which means coming to terms with their own history, the Eastern Front um, was, was something that they felt very strongly the need to atone for. So then you fast forward, you have Willy Brandt and you have Ostpolitik and the, the uh, reconciliation with, with the East. All of that to the good. And also Germany, you know, uh, never again, never again meant never again war. We Germans will not unleash war. We will not be militaristic anywhere. Peace is the prize. All of that is fine and laudable, except for two reasons. One, Germans conflated, um, when the Soviet Union uh, collapsed, they conflated the Soviet Union with Russia. And so everything was based around, if we can get on with the Kremlin, mm -hmm. um, then uh, we, are, we are doing our um, uh, atonement. And uh, through that, the, the um, naivety around thinking that if you integrate your economies, uh, this German phrase, Wandel durch Handel, which means change through trade. So the more we Germans, we Westerners, we European Union trade with Russia and China, the more they will change and the more they will become like us. And that clearly, and a long time earlier than February 24th, um, back to 2014 and the first invasion of Ukraine and the annexation of Crimea was abundantly clear. But nobody, it's not a particularly German problem. The Brits didn't want to have anything to do particularly with um, anything strongly punitive towards Russia um, in 2014. London grad, you know, the whole city of London is based around uh, laundering dirty money. And, um, you know, we had the, the again, the equally naive... Um, new era with China and, and the red carpet that George Osborne laid out in, 20, in 2010. And so, John, if you look back to, and you've <coughs> characterised it as the, the outsourcing of defence, trade and energy, on two of those three, the German model has done an enormous transformation yeah. in the last 10, 11, 10, 9, 10 months of so Germany was 55% dependent on Russia for its gas, um, right up till up to and including and shortly after the invasion. Um, now it is somewhere between five and seven percent, which is so low that you don't actually need it because you can always make adjustments. Um, it's also gone from almost no reserves to 100% uh, storage capacity by getting LNG terminals from America, Canada, Norway, and Qatar. Um, so in six months, that is an incredible turnaround. 
So it's a very interesting German trait of um, whenever they make mistakes, they were just totally different contexts. They were way behind on um, the whole electrification of the motor industry. Um, they were nowhere to be seen when Tesla and all these others came onto the scene in 2015, 16, 17, 18. Suddenly, they just caught up. So they have this amazing propensity to, eat humble, to, to make mistakes, to eat humble pie, and to learn very quickly. And on security. So on security, the Titan vendor speech that Schultz gave, I and mean, Schultz is a curious figure. I mean, he is, um, he's been in power now literally this weekend uh, for a year, uh, actually middle of next week. Um, he is getting the job done in the most uncharismatic way possible. I mean, he is sort of, you know, charisma minus. And um, uh, it's, in fact, it's the two Greens, Robert Harbeck, the economy minister, and Annalena Baerbock, the foreign minister, who are absolutely riding high in the opinion polls. They've got great public attraction because they've got great, great emotional um, uh, empathy. Um, Schultz doesn't. He just goes into rooms. He just stares at people, buries his head in, in, inside, and he always ends up by whatever has been decided, says, yes, I always knew that. Um, you know, so, sort of know it all in hindsight are, are his two things. So he doesn't endear himself to anybody, and yet he does amazing business. He, so he goes off to China um, to see Xi Jinping about five days after the Chinese Congress. Uh, a lot of countries were very, very nervous. The Brits, the Americans, the French were very nervous about him doing that, particularly with a dozen corporate CEOs in tow and thinking, what on earth is he doing? And this is prostrating yourself in front of Xi, who just had his, uh, you know, the, his predecessor turfed out of, of the Great Hall, and it just looked terrible and consolidated his power. And he comes back with this amazing declaration, effectively condemning Russia for threatening to use uh, nuclear, uh, making nuclear yeah. threats to... And nobody thought, you know, he hadn't even told them that he was going, going off to do this, and he just did it. So underneath this lack of charisma is, is, is obviously a, a steeliness and an ability to um, deliver. And on security, it's, um, you know, I've had so many arguments with very dear German friends who say peace is the highest achievement. And I always say, no, it isn't. It's the second highest achievement. Uh, war is not the worst thing. It's the second worst thing. The worst thing is to allow dictators to get away with things. Um, and it's still so, so deeply ingrained, this idea, this hostility or this nervousness within German society about being seen to be a military power. But they are getting it now and in one fell swoop. And it was an extraordinary operation. You know, to find 100 billion euros for increased defence spending, to immediately sign up to 2% uh, GDP, which the Germans have uh, politely resisted um, for years, and for completely overturning uh, 75 years of military doctrine on a Sunday morning. And he told his finance minister and coalition partner, the Liberal leader, Christian Lindner, the night before, oh, by the way, I need you to find me 100 billion by tomorrow morning. And uh, he told the, the two Greens on uh, an hour before he made the speech, so he's, he's clearly an operator. Thank you so much to John Kampfner for joining Warren Keller in Dingle. On our next episode, I'm joined by a chef, a journalist and a dancer to explore sustainability in food and farming. To make sure you don't miss that or any of our future episodes, subscribe now wherever you get your podcasts. This has been a South Wind Blows production, and I'm Christopher Kassan. Thank you for joining us. I look forward to your company next time. <laughs>